All right, it's 10 o'clock. So hey everyone, Charlie here from the Atomic Age, and this is something I've been wanting to do for a little while now. Just kind of go over some of the, in a more, uh, let's say, concrete way, go over some of this reactor stuff, because I, I touch on these things in videos, but trying to pick up any kind of base knowledge about reactors just from like the parts I touch on in videos would be... Uh, a cumbersome effort to say the least. So I want to, I wanted to just like do a proper kind of introduction to reactors to lay the groundwork, hopefully make a lot of this stuff more clear as opposed to getting little bits and pieces that are relevant in videos and movies and TVs and such that I talk about. So yeah, we'll be covering the atom fission chain reactions and then more. And then that's, that's the basic underlying physics. Then we can get into some more, I guess, uh, more real world stuff, if you want to call it that fuels, moderators and coolants, and then, uh, actually go through some reactors at the end, see how some of that comes together. Some reactors, not <clears throat> some reactor designs very briefly, like a slide each. And oh uh, yeah, we got a nice little image of a power plant here. It's not a nuclear power plant because it has some smokestacks as you can see, <laughs> but yeah, let's get into it. All right, uh, just some uh, just some like few notes before we get started. Not necessarily disclaimers, but just like some some bounds on what this presentation will and will not do for you. So the intended audience for this is the interested lay person, um, which means there will be some technical familiarity assumed. Oh, and just to be clear, please ask any and all questions. I welcome any and all questions. That's what I'm here for. But going through these slides. Recently, before this presentation, I worked on this mostly like a few months ago. Um, it may be a bit technical in some spots, so I'll try and give like the abbreviated version and then like the more technical stuff can be on the slide. But I'll assume some technical familiarity out there. We're not going to go. And what that means is like, you know, basic kind of like math skills. But we'll, we'll get into that as we go there. It's not going to be completely dumbed down. But maybe there should be a version like that. Uh, I kind of mentioned point two in the beginning, just kind of bring you up to some some basic up to speed so you can follow discussion in the news and such. Um, and I think this goes without saying that this lecture, this these few slides will not teach you to be a nuclear engineer. Um, <laughs> we're not really going into like general nuclear theory. It's going to be kind of a, what applies to reactors. So trying to apply that knowledge to other things like maybe nuclear bombs or like criticality safety accidents or other stuff may not make sense because of how the info is presented here but this is good for all reactor stuff and uh yeah we're not going into how a reactor is operated because I, i'm not <clears throat> excuse me i'm not a reactor operator i'm not uh familiar with like you know the overall concepts but we're not going into the nitty-gritty of how a reactor is operated just to clarify, um, and if you are in the nuclear industry, you'll, you'll most likely not get a lot out of this presentation. It's going to be too basic for you, but if you want to watch it and provide any feedback or comments to me, I welcome that as well. So with that out of the way, let's get into it. So what is a nuclear reactor? So nuclear reactor is just a controlled way to have nuclear fuel uh, and to extract energy from it. Uh, in nature to get like a chain reaction when i say in nature i mean like naturally if it were to happen without the intervention of humans or some other intelligent being um it's a very unstable process that doesn't really do anything useful but when you design a system around a reactor and reactor is really just a code name for like a controlled nuclear reaction then you can extract useful useful stuff out of it, what we call work in the physics physics world, uh, but what we might call like some wattage or horsepower in a more colloquial sense. And for this lecture, we're going to be talking about power generating reactors, that is heat generating reactors. So like the one picture below, the one that powers a city, we're not going to be talking about like research reactors or like neutron flux reactors or stuff like that doesn't mean we can't at some point in the future but we're going to stick to uh, power generating reactors and it's also worth noting that this can be a point of confusion is that 
a heat generating reactor does not mean a thermal reactor. Thermal reactor is a nuclear engineering term and we'll, we'll get into that. So just because it generates heat does not mean it's a thermal reactor. It's important to note. <laughs> and then, yeah, we can look at the schematic down here of a pressurized water reactor. I'm sure I've gone through this before, but, uh, oh, okay. In presentation mode, I was able to have access to a laser pointer. So hopefully my, my mouse is sufficiently large here. We got the reactor vessel. This is where the fuel is and got the control rods here as well to control the reaction. And then like the reddish yellow to convey heat pressurizer keeps the the water in here a liquid pressurized water reactor the water stays liquid in this first loop and then we got a pump move water back into the reactor steam generator here the hot water from the primary loop uh, turns water in the secondary loop into steam which then feeds a turbine spins a turbine Spins a generator, sends some zap zap to your city. <laughs> Sorry, electricity to your city. And then water from this turbine loop then goes to interface with this third loop here, which can be a river or lake or a cooling tower. And that turns that back into liquid water to go back into the steam generator and pick up more heat. Now, you want to get as much heat out of this cycle as possible after the turbine. Any heat that's in here is just waste heat um, because. The more heat there is in your loop, the less heat you can transfer. I don't know if that's obvious or not. So you want to get as much heat out as possible. The bit, uh, how much heat you can transfer is based only on temperature difference. So the bigger the temperature difference, the more heat you can transfer. Just kind of obvious when you stop and think about it. It's like a gas tank. If your gas tank is three quarters full, you can only put a quarter of a gallon in it. But if it's empty, you can put or excuse me, a quarter of a tank. But if it's empty, you can put a full tank. It's the same same idea there. You want to get your gas tank empty. And that's how you, that's when you go through this condenser loop here before you put more gas back into it. Not the best analogy, but it's more about like the the fill fill amount as opposed to using gas or gas mileage or anything like that. Alright, so after a little overview of the reactor, let's wind it back let's get really small let's get basic let's talk about the <clears throat> excuse me let's talk about the atom so the atom is the basic building block of life everything around us is made of atoms it is the smallest chunk of matter you can have that still has the properties of that matter so like carbon or iron one atom is the tiniest amount that you can have of carbon and iron and still call it carbon or iron if you were to split that atom iron further, you will get two different atoms. Uh, one example is neon and sulfur. So you cannot split the atom and still have that same material that you started with. Yeah, so down here in the periodic table, it's a little small, but it'll it'll be bigger on a, a subsequent slide. Got all the known elements. And uh, yeah, each one of these, this is all representing a single atom at its most basic level. And then for each element, each element can have many isotopes. Isotopes are very important to nuclear engineering. Uh, because while they're all the same element, they can all have much different nuclear properties. That may be not clear at the moment, but hopefully that will become clearer as we progress through these slides. And then, yeah, this is just a nice artist rendition I found of an atom. Very nice and artsy fartsy. I like it. <laughs> All right, so atoms have two parts, the nucleus or center. Uh, this is made of protons and neutrons, which are uh, of themselves not the smallest particle. That is, protons and neutrons are made of smaller things, but we don't really care about that for our purposes. So we'll just, we'll just stop at protons and neutrons or what make up the nucleus, and that would be a little bright spot in this this lovely piece of uh, art here and then the electrons which orbit the nucleus and the electron cloud and that would be all these wispy stuff and this is a a better rendition than you know there's that typical model of an atom that has like you know the dot in the middle and then like the three particles with the the ellipses orbiting it that is a very old way of thinking about how the atom looks it's really we're not going to get into quantum mechanics here, but uh, the electron cloud is a quantum mechanic, quantum mechanical wonderland. 
electrons may be here, electrons may be there. There's like distributions and uncertainty. But the good news is we don't really care about electrons. That's Electrons are the realm of chemistry. So anytime someone mentions chemicals or chemistry or like, I don't know, like combustion in car engines or explosions, that's all chemistry. That's all electrons. That is only driven by electrons. Uh, here in the uh, nuclear world, we care about the nucleus. So nuclear just means it deals with the nucleus. Maybe that's profound. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so anything that deals with protons and neutrons and that, that center little nucleus is the realm of nuclear. That's nuclear bombs, nuclear reactors. Uh, we don't really care about electrons in the nuclear world. Electrons can affect, uh, they can deal with like radiation and stuff, but in terms of like splitting atoms and chain reactions, we don't really care about electrons. And then just to address the term atomic bomb or atomic power versus nuclear bomb or nuclear power, atomic bomb and atomic, atomic is an antiquated term uh, because as I just said, nuclear bombs and nuclear power plants deal with the nucleus and not the atom. So it's kind of pedantic, but it's technically important that, you know, it's not atomic bomb or atomic power. It's nuclear bombs and nuclear power, but atomic has that nice retro ring to it, hence my channel name. <laughs> All right, so Adam, finished talking about the Adam. Now let's get into elements, which it touched on on that first Adam slide with the periodic table. Elements and isotopes. First, elements. So the element, uh, an atom is only ever one element. It can change elements based on radioactive decay, but if we have a stable atom, it will only ever be one element unless something you know changes it won't just spontaneously turn into another element unless it's like radioactive but we'll get into that uh at, the, at another point so an element is defined by the number of protons it has remember we talked about uh an atom's nucleus having protons and neutrons the number of protons determines an element so hydrogen always has one proton so it's element one uranium always has 92 protons so it's element eight. Excuse me, element 92. So over here we have a, an elemental symbol for hydrogen here. You can see atomic number one, one proton. Hydrogen always has one proton. And then it'll have like a symbol, probably aware of the symbol. H for hydrogen, U for uranium. Some of them don't make sense. PU for plutonium. There was probably already an element that had PL, which I can't think of off the top of my head. Some are nonsensical, like silver is like AG, but I think that's that comes from a Latin word. Gold is AU, tungsten's W, lead is PB. There's a lot of like uh, traditional or uh, antiquity type names. Any of the elements that were like known to the <clears throat> so, excuse me, my voice is not cooperating today. Any elements that were known in antiquity have uh, a, you know symbols that don't really make sense. Like iron is Fe, ferrite, and that's just because that's uh, older, very ancient humans knew about those, so those names just carry through. All right, so now we know element. It's protons, same number of protons, same element, always, forever. Uranium will always ever only have 92 protons. Hydrogen will only ever have one proton. So the differences come in the form of isotopes, and what defines an isotope is the number of neutrons. So one element can have many isotopes. There can be many different numbers of neutrons for one element. Not all of these are stable. In fact, most are radioactive. Only some are stable. And for something like uranium, none of them are stable. They're all radioactive. But let's just go through these examples here. So a light hydrogen which uh, is sometimes known as proteum, not often. Uh, it can also be written as hydrogen-1 or 1H, as shown right here. This is how I usually write it in technical documents. One protons, no neutrons. That's important. Normal hydrogen has no neutrons. So light hydrogen, as it were here, is the most common isotope of natural hydrogen, something like 
maybe not 99, 99.9, the vast majority <laughs> of natural hydrogen. Okay, so when I say natural hydrogen, that's what occurs in nature. You could also refer to that as just hydrogen. That can be a bit ambiguous, but natural hydrogen has both light hydrogen and, and heavy hydrogen. But if you were to purify these materials into only hydrogen one or hydrogen two, you could call it, you know, light hydrogen, protium, heavy hydrogen, deuterium. But natural hydrogen or just hydrogen has both of them in it. And that's just how it works. We're not going to get into the why of that necessarily. It has to just do with, yeah, there's, you can, it might be an interesting question to go to in some point, but we'll just leave it at that, that elements tend to have natural abundances of things, natural proportions of the isotopes that occur in them. And it's, it's a constant thing to find in, in natural elements on earth. All right, next up we got heavy hydrogen, which is always typically referred to as deuterium, which has one proton and one neutron. So that one neutron makes it heavy hydrogen, and this gives it different nuclear properties, which we'll get into in a second. So a very small amount of this exists in natural hydrogen. Uh, the water you drink is made of natural hydrogen, so there's a small amount of heavy hydrogen in water that you drink. And if we go through here for uranium-235, which is the primary fissile isotope of uranium, the vast majority of reactors in the world run on is uranium-235. 92 protons, like we discussed earlier, 143 neutrons. Uranium-238, which is the part that we typically don't want, 92 protons, 146 neutrons. Plutonium-239, which is the primary fissile isotope of plutonium used in nuclear bombs and uh, some reactor fuels. 94 protons, 145 neutrons. And as I mentioned before, isotopes can be stable or unstable. And that's uh, unstable. It's just another word for radioactive. Or I guess maybe it's better to say radioactive is another word for unstable. So this, to summarize all this, protons equals the element, and then neutrons equals the isotope. You can't just look at how many neutrons an atom has and know which element. You need to know the number of protons and know which isotope you have. But uh, yeah, so once you know the number of protons, then you can look at the number of neutrons and know which isotope of which element you have. So yeah, just to reiterate, light hydrogen is an isotope of hydrogen. Heavy hydrogen is also an isotope of hydrogen. And then yeah, to reiterate again at the bottom, different isotopes have different nuclear properties, sometimes very much so. Like in the case of uranium, uranium-235 is fissile and can support a chain reaction, whereas uranium-238 cannot and these are the same element but just different just different numbers of neutrons gives it vastly different nuclear properties we're not going to get into the why of that but uh just know that different numbers of neutrons means different nuclear properties oh all right so we can just like look at the uh the periodic table of the elements here for a second so i had if I was going to do this in slideshow mode, I was going to have some like arrows pop up here, but I'll just run you through it. So it's uh, another important general distinction for the for the periodic table of the elements is to split things into. Well, let's just run through it first. All right, so we got hydrogen up, up here at the top left, and then helium over here. So these columns have to do with numbers of electrons and chemical properties. So we don't really care about that too much in nuclear engineering, but that is why it is. This is shaped the way it is. Everything in this column has the same number of like what we'll call outer electrons available for chemical interaction. Which uh, so the number of electrons you have available determines chemical properties and such. So all these elements over here, helium, neon, argon, these are all like, like neon lights. These are all using like neon lights. These are all very stable elements. They don't react with things because they have full electrons, full electron shells. Oh, we got some more basic building blocks of life here. We got carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. These are all very light elements. Uranium and plutonium are all the way down here. These are very heavy. So this this is important to note in, in nuclear engineering too, is light elements versus 
heavy elements. So hydrogen and carbon are light elements. These are you may have heard may refer to these as uh, neutron moderators, and it's precisely because they are light elements, and then heavy elements like uranium and plutonium, all the way down here. We also got iron here. Iron is important for. Uh, it's kind of like the start of like the heavy, the heavy elements. And it's also, uh, we'll get into that in a second about iron. It's a, it's an important cutoff point for fusion versus fission, which I think we're getting into in the next slide here. So let's move along. <clears throat> All right. Binding energy. Uh, I don't want to, as I was going back through these slides, I realized I may be getting a little too detailed, but we'll we'll go through this one. This is pretty much, I think, as detailed as we get into the, the basic nuclear physics here. But uh, most of nature is about getting to lower energy states. So like an apple falling out of a tree, the apple in the tree was at a high energy state. Apple on the ground is at a lower energy state. Uh, and then radioactive decay is the same thing. So atoms that are radioactive are at a high unstable energy state by giving off radiation they get to lower stable energy states which is a non-radioactive atom that can take a very long time but that is the that is the goal is to get stable okay so we mentioned protons and neutrons make up the nucleus of an atom uh Protons and neutrons in a nucleus are in a lower energy state than if the protons and neutrons are just flying around. Uh, there's a if you take all the protons and neutrons of a of an atom, say we have like 20 protons and neutrons, the difference in energy between them flying around and them being in the nucleus is called binding energy, which is the difference in energy that it takes to hold these uh, hold these nucleons together, uh, nucleons, excuse me. These are particles that make up the nucleus. So uh, being in the nucleus, the takeaway here is that being in the nucleus requires less energy than being out and about in the world. So that's why protons and neutron, neutrons want to exist together in the nucleus in this lower energy state. Um, yeah, when you add or remove particles from the nucleus, it releases or takes in energy. And this is important for figuring out when you want fusion or fission. <laughs> so some of this may be like bouncing around. I'll try and keep it uh, simple, not get too detailed here. But uh, as I mentioned iron earlier on the periodic table, it's a cutoff point for fusion or fission. So if your nucleus, if your atom or nucleus is lighter than iron or nickel, so like something like hydrogen or carbon, adding particles to that nucleus releases energy and that's what makes fusion possible you only do fusion with elements lighter than iron if the nucleus is heavier than iron removing particles from the nucleus releases energy and that's what makes fission possible splitting atoms and that's why uranium and plutonium work for fission but the opposite is also true if you were to split elements lighter than iron you would take in energy and if you were to fuse elements heavier than iron you would also take in energy so we can just move on to this next slide here and just summarize that up the takeaway here is that you use light elements to do fusion and you use heavy elements to do fission so this explains why like a it's called a hydrogen bomb because you're using hydrogen to to do fusion and then like a fission bomb is uranium or plutonium all right, so now we got that out of the way. That might be the more confusing slides in the in the slideshow, but I'll let you guys be the judge of that. <laughs> All right, let's get into splitting atoms. So nuclear reactors, we split uh, atoms. Well, I'll say atoms, but I really mean nuclei, nucleuses, nucleus. We split atoms with neutrons. Neutrons are a neutral particle. Uh, they're given off when atoms split, sometimes given off when atoms decay. Protons are very, uh, you know, it's almost kind of getting beyond my knowledge a little bit here, but I don't think protons are just randomly ejected from the nucleus like neutrons are. And protons are also have a charge, so they want to, they would quickly get sucked up by 
other atoms, whereas neutrons are neutral. They just fly around until they uh, they fly around a lot longer than protons would. But anyway, new fission is done with neutrons. And like I mentioned earlier, the best atoms to split are heavy ones like uranium or plutonium. When we split a nucleus, so we have a, an, an atom of uranium-235 here. We've got a neutron coming in splits this neutron uh excuse me splits this atom of uranium 235 and then we get two fission products here which is the the two elements left over i think in a previous slide i said if you if you were to split iron you'd get neon and sulfur off the top of my head i don't have two two uranium fission products available but you get two smaller uh atoms so the 235 here is the sum of protons and neutrons so you could have for example, one of these fission products could have 100 particles in the nucleus, and the other could have 132 particles in this example because we have three neutrons. So the number of neutrons and then the particles in the fission products adds up to the 235. Uh, a basic law of physics, matter can neither be created nor destroyed. There's some caveats to that, but... Yeah, the number these these fission pro the number of particles in these fission products plus the neutrons will add up to 235. And in this case, we got three neutrons, so this is a rather a rather good split of uranium. I think the average is about 2.4 neutrons per fission. Uh, but in addition to what we got here, we also get some gamma radiation, so gamma rays, generally the most dangerous form of radiation. And then it's also worth noting that these fission products are very high energy, which means high speed. So they get shot off when this atom splits and then they start hitting other atoms and slowing down. And in the process of slowing down, they give energy to other atoms and this all kind of turns into heat. And this is where this is where the energy of nuclear fission comes from. When we're making heat in a reactor from splitting atoms, it's the, the friction of these fission products, basically, like brakes on a car. That's where all this heat is coming from. If these neutrons go off and they can split some other fissile atoms, then we could we could be getting a chain reaction setting up here. So to start a chain reaction, we need fissile atoms. Only fissile atoms can support chain reactions. There's also something called uh, fissionable, which means that an atom is easily split. And fissile atoms are a subset of fissionable atoms, but fissile atoms uh, can support chain reactions. All right, so now that we can have a chain reaction, we have some fissile atoms, we have some neutrons flying around. Uh, now we can figure out if we're going to get a chain reaction or not. There's three, three, three possible outcomes from neutrons and fissile atoms. Uh, only three. I'll get into some caveats on that, but one of these three things has to happen if we have neutrons and fissile atoms together. So we'll start with a critical reaction. So this is when we have this is when we have neutrons and neutrons are flying out of atoms being split and then finding precisely the same amount of more atoms to split. So the number of neutrons we have is is constant over time. So it's like cruising on the highway. Uh the number of neutrons being released isn't going up, it's not going down. We have a constant stable reaction, constant rate of fission or power over time. Uh, I think I mentioned this earlier. This is, if you don't design it to be stable, it's going to be unstable and it's going to tend to go to the other states we're about to talk about. But yeah, this is where nuclear reactors operate. The ones we're talking about that generate electricity or horsepower for a ship or something. Uh, they operate at critical operation, critical steady operation. Another outcome is a subcritical reaction. So this is where uh, the number of neutrons is decreasing over time. The power is decreasing over time. The number of atoms being split is decreasing over time. So this is a safe configuration, but you can't run a reactor in this configuration because this will, there's no reaction going on basically. Uh, in my world of nuclear transport, this is where all, <laughs> all, all fissile materials transport is subcritical. I think that should be obvious, but perhaps not. Per perhaps worth stating, you know, everyone in chain reaction transporting nuclear material. 
and uh yeah so when reactors want to lower their power they'll go briefly subcritical lower the power and uh yeah subcritical is a safe safe place to be this is what happened when the chernobyl reactor stalled in the chernobyl series it went, it went subcritical oh yeah next up we got the supercritical reaction and this is the the final other outcome of a chain reaction increasing rate of fission over time increasing rate of neutrons being emitted increasing rate of fission you have atoms being split power is increasing speeding up gaining power this exponentiates and uh oh how 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 long was my camera frozen there sorry about that this is uh super critical is generally bad <laughs> do not generally want super critical so this will keep increasing in power until generally one of two things happens. It'll either get too hot, and when fissile material gets hot for uh, nuclear physics reasons, it tends to slow itself down when it gets hot. Uh, it starts absorbing some more neutrons. I think I mentioned this in the Chernobyl Part 5 breakdown. Uh, the, the uranium-238 in a uranium in a uranium reactor will start absorbing more neutrons as it gets hotter i'll leave it at that <clears throat> i'm not gonna jump into the the why of that but yeah so if it gets too hot it'll start slowing down maybe stop at a critical state or in the case of a nuclear bomb it disassembles itself which is about the most polite way to describe what happens in a nuclear bomb <laughs> uh just the fissile material just all like flies apart from each other and can't sustain a chain reaction anymore uh, that can happen and also criticality safety accidents so if you had like some fissile solution in a drum it might slosh out like a third of the solution if it was a critical chain reaction and then at that point it's lost enough material to go subcritical so that's also a, a form of disassembling itself so yeah three outcomes for a chain reaction it can only ever be one of these three uh what i work in, in like criticality safety or nuclear reactors you can it can move between these states but it will only ever be these three states so that's not to say like it'll only ever like you start it it'll only ever go critical subcritical excuse me subcritical or supercritical but it can it can bounce around between these states but in order to do so something has to change that last bullet point if something doesn't change it's going to stay where it is that may be obvious but it gets complicated there's a ton of factors that can affect chain reactions and they all kind of they can all kind of affect each other but uh, that's a that's a discussion for criticality safety which is not today we are doing reactors